Well, that is quite a score, David. <laughs> oh man, I just I really enjoyed that, and I especially liked how you like didn't score section E um, because that sort of lets me out of an ethical dilemma. <laughs> you know, when when somebody scores section E so beautifully, I always just feel torn at not being able to evaluate it because of the terms of our um, of the orchestration challenge, right? Uh, so by by not scoring it, you gave me an out, and that was great. All right, so so you know, let's talk about a few things here. Um, you know, that like marking every five bars on the you know on to tell us what bar it is. Um, that's probably as unnecessary in a context like this as is marking every bar, kind of like in a film score style. It's better just to have the uh, the number of the bar at the beginning of the system. And then, you know, I mean, even though like it might be, you know, 10 or 12 bars on a page, sometimes even more, I can, I can count, right? So you don't need this, um, at least for the purposes of these, uh, of these orchestration challenges. Also, um, I don't know how experienced you are with uh, with Sibelius uh, text, but there we go. Yeah, so just, you know, fill in this thing. It just, you know, because sometimes I might be dealing with different images. There might just be screenshots that don't have any uh, titles on them yet. So it kind of helps me out um, if you... Uh, if you have written this in. Um, and there was this one other thing too. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, real important, all right. Um, I think, you know, like, just to, to not be too picky about it, but like in this case, um, I think you should mark Divisi and Unison when they occur, okay? And then uh, here in your wind parts, you need to tell me which person is playing, right? So here you have two people coming in, two flutists coming in on this entrance. And then is this Atu? Is this a single flute player? What's going on? And here you have a single oboe line. Is that one oboist? Is it two? How, how many is it? What's going on, right? All right. So, so those are just a few, you know, kind of basic things. I think that um, there might have been some blank staves missing from the version that you sent me, like on the first page. So I put them back in just so that we could see the uh, the scope of your scoring right at the beginning. So you know, you know, harp, celesta, um, mostly triple winds except for no piccolo, um, and uh, if it if it occurs later, uh, and I've and I've spaced it out, I apologize. But yeah. Um, and then, you know, then our standard uh, brass complement and so on. And so, yeah, and the, the use of the chimes is just really amazing, as we just heard in that mock-up. So, so let's talk about the scoring of this first page. Um, I'm not entirely convinced by uh, the harmony right in here. I, th I think this is a little too deliberate, right? You know, like rather than going up to the C, right, you know, in the, in the regular course of the... Um, you know, the way that the suspension sort of carries forward. Um, yeah, it's just a, just feel, and then like, then this feels just really deliberate, the way you wrap this up going F from F sharp to G, I, you know. Now the rest of the, the rest of the, um, the bass, I don't have a big problem with, but it just, maybe this needs to be rethought a little bit. It just feels like you're leading us by the nose and it's a kind of uncomfortable uh, sort of a motion, right? I'm not saying that it's wrong, but it's just, kind of uncomfortable right it's because everything else is so beautifully smooth and and works really really well but this is just kind of like you know it's like the scratch in the record right it's like the the fly in the ointment kind of a kind of motion in the bass and you know I, I must say that like this this addresses one of the concerns in my uh criteria uh that um the pitch weight is in the upper middle register of the piano for like this entire first uh, 10 bars. So, you know, so by adding some bass and filling it out and stuff and just making it more about the character of the music rather than the, than the, than the registers itself, you know, the rest, registers themselves being a character. I think that that um, really deals with that nicely. So, um, so yeah, so let's, let's, 
discuss the scoring though now. So, you know, clarinets and bassoons, there's a beautiful soft sound that is being played in the mock-up and it is possible to get that wonderful sound and like where you've got these tenor register bassoons and thirds and the clarinets in really, really soft octaves. Um, there's a very confused mosquito flying around. Hopefully that won't get onto the recording. Um, uh, the, the way that this is, you know, I mean, that is possible, but but just to let you know, like, unless the players take that real kind of soft, laid-back approach, it, it could sound more, you know, kind of accordion-like, right, rather than having that, that really beautiful quality that we're hearing in the mock-up. Uh, and then this um, bass clarinet coming out right in here, it's nice, the enclosure. Now, you know, you continue that approach and you start adding things, right? So you're adding English horn and, uh, and which horn? We have four horns and see which one is this one. Is it first horn, second horn? Probably first horn, right? So let's say that that's first horn, doubling with uh, English horn at first, right? And then you have got uh, your cellos and double basses more or less kind of sort of doubling at the octave and then things sort of mix up as you go forward with you know this English horn part and uh, and French horn part uh, doubling the uh, the cellos and so on so yeah so um so it, it's really nice subtle scoring I, I like the way that this sort of carries forward and then you start to add on uh, the second violins and by the time you get to here like the 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 sound picture is getting bigger and bigger I, I love this voice crossing right in here where you have violas coming in an octave above the uh, the first violins uh, and and they're being doubled by I'm assuming a really soft oboe I don't know if this is Atu or probably I would say don't do more than one oboe here and then like blending with the second flute uh, that will work out fine. All right, and then here you drop down so that you don't push too high but uh, I almost feel like like you know the, with the with the way that you are pushing the resonance up there um, with your first flute or maybe it's Atu flutes even more so uh, of and then first clarinet uh, I almost feel like you need to to mellow that out with the um, with the first violins so or with the violas just leave the violas up there why did they have to drop down just leave the first violins where they were keep the violas up in that register so that they can double this right and then I think you get a much beautiful smoother sound and you know this is all addressing um, my concern, my other concern, does the treatment of the melody represent an emotional and timbral progression? And yes, it does in your score. So, you know, so that's pretty well done. Now, uh, you know, uh, here we are getting even more into the, um, the whole question of repeated notes under a slur, right? So... Uh, you know, we, we've, you know, as I have critiqued people on just dropping the piano uh, slurs onto their wind and brass, uh, their wind, brass, and, and uh, string parts as kind of not making any sense, like, you know, in the context of how they're scoring it, uh, or, or it's, it's, not, it's, not conv it's not convincing me that they've really thought about that consequence of just dropping a slur like this under, you know, over repeated notes. And then here, like this is making it all the more of a, you know, more of an indication to me that this isn't being thought out, right? If you really wanted kind of a soft pause between this, you should not have a slur over it, right? Maybe you could slur up into this and then ta-ta. Or maybe this could have all been like portato or some, some other kind of thing. Or you could say sempre legato and, and just leave off the slur entirely. But one way or another, I, I just don't understand what you mean here, except for to guess that you just left the those slur marks on, right? So, um, I, I think you could, uh, you could make your slurs go like this. It's just, 
just much more readable for your orchestra players. Okay. Occasionally, I will slur to like a, a long series of ties. Like if I have like five tied whole notes in a row, then I might do a slur off the end of the of the you know if I'm slurring down into it and then holding the note, then I might just slur into that. But I you know, I wouldn't have a slur that covered the same distance as very very long ties. But in a case like this. You know, see, like this, this is much more sensible. Look at what you've got here. You know, da, ta, ta, right? As opposed to, I, I don't know what this is, right? And then here you have an in incomplete tie, right? So I think you need to, you need to seriously proofread your slurs and, and other things, right? And then, you know, here we have like some slurs and some not. And uh, apologies for the vertical crowding here, but just to sort of, pull this down so we have a can take a better look. All right, so shouldn't this slur start here? All right, and then here you're slurring to a tie and then you know, shouldn't it be like this? Or maybe like um like this, right? Anyway, um, yeah, but it's just a little inconsistent. What is slurred and how they're slurred and, and what does it mean when you have a repeated note and so on and so forth. I'm just not seeing enough thought put into that, okay? So um, so really, please, just, you know, in a case where I'm seeing a, a slur being reused from a piano part and it ends up in, in sort of idiosyncrasies, I will question it, right? And you should too. There are ways of making this smooth. There are ways of making it all flow beautifully without having to use the piano slurs, right? So you just always question whether or not you're using that. And now here, this should be a long. Um, here, let me get the let me get the keypad back. Um, this should just be a long. Right. There's like there's no need for these to be dotted half note ties, All right? Now let's say you had like the diminuendo starting in the middle of the bar. Then I would say, yeah, just tie it, All right? It's a little strange. Um, you know, this is a half note, and then you have. All right, so so shouldn't this be a half note tied? This should be a dotted half note tied to a half note, right? Not a half note tied tied to a dotted half note, right? So it should be like this rhythm, right? Not, you know, because this just sort of kind of breaks the rules, right, of the of splitting in the half. So some of this is just kind of careless um, errors and du durations and things like that. Okay, but you know, it's, it's not a not a serious crisis or anything, but. Yeah, just, just try to proofread some of this stuff a little bit more. All right, so we talked about the texture going forward, right? And then here you're kind of getting this beautiful silvery sound here um, with your doublings and the harmonization and so on. And I feel that it all leads very logically, you know, one thing leads very logically into the next. Um, you know, just kind of be aware that, like, by suppressing the strings and not making them part of any of these higher pitches or anything like that you know it, it will it will really have kind of more of a band kind of a sound which is not bad necessarily and it'll also but it'll also kind of have a slightly edgier sound with a with the wind color okay rather than if you were to to sort of blend it or merge it in some way and bring in the strings into the color a little bit higher um but you know that that would be that you know that would be some of my critique on that. But it's not really you know it's nothing fatal about it or or anything like that. But you know definitely not 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 necessarily ready. Um, some of these some of those little notation errors and things like that are not quite ready for the stands. But but you know the overall approach is very very cool. Um, one thing that you might want to question, uh, you know, especially with the, the the care that you take and the kind of the delicacy that you have with a lot of your scoring is whether or not you know, momentary reductions of of textural weight uh, will help you to make points with your musical phrasing, right? You know, like for instance, you know, you know, like for instance, what if you were to to lessen the uh, the amount of tone weight here? You know, ba da, and then bring it back da da da. You know what I mean? It's 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 there are. 
you know, and, and also what if the, um, you know, what if you were to follow like, uh, what if the nuances were to, you know, in certain parts were to work against one another, you know, like with the, with this part, this sort of middle voice part having its own kind of dynamic arc. And then this, you know, the, the more melodic part having, you know, working against it and surging forwards when the, when the middle voice was finished. Right. Right. So, so I just think some of the, you know, just because of the approach that you're taking, some dynamic management is in order here. Okay. What well, one, one final kind of argument about, you know, not taking this approach with your, um, with your uh, staff numbers is it just clutters up the page, right? You have, you end up with things like this with like numbers squished in between bars and objects and so on and so forth. Whereas if it's just over here, like at the top of the system, yeah, that's the most professional published way of dealing with it, I think. And it's just, you know, just the easiest that conductors eye flicks to it and they immediately know where they are rather than having to sort of look through the score and sort of pick out, distinguish, you know, numbers, what does the number mean? It could could be right next to a triplet or a quintuplet or something like that and, and, and really confuse the hell out of the eye, right? So just to make it visually as simple as possible. But, you know, all that aside, very, very cool. Beautiful, like I said before, kind of a silvery sort of um, texture in here. Really intriguing. And over here on this page, you can kind of see, like, the problem right away that we have... A number here but we don't have a number there right so it's just really is the most kind of automatic thing for a conductor or score reader um, to just like have their eye flick over to the beginning of the page and then to not see anything it means that they have to count backwards right so 15 14 13 12 and, and so on so it's just easier to count forwards because the you know the the eye sort of recognizes patterns going forward if this is marked bar 11 the you know they'll just see the 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 four bars in between and automatically know that this is bar 15 right so it's just better to put it here all right uh not to get on that high horse too much now i, I noticed something about this passage is this like the pizzicato sort of brought in this kind of sense of pacing you know just like do 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 kind of like a walking bass really um which I mean, it, it works, it's fine, but it, it I feel it just sort of distracts from the kind of impressionistic feeling. But if you're trying to get away from that, that that's perfectly fine, but yeah. Um, and then, um, I, you know, I would actually mark it pianissimo, right? Maybe it's just too prominent, right? So just, just have everything pianissimo except for your harp and celesta. Now, the next question is whether or not your harp and celesta are too low, right? Um, maybe you try this out in the in the mock-up just hike everything up an octave and then and then um, then of course you can drop um, those uh, those elements or just leave them where they are so maybe bring this up an octave uh, and uh, this up an octave and then leave this where it is it's just you know for a few reasons one is um, I you know I just feel it like the harp in, in this kind of scoring it speaks a little bit a little bit better higher and so does the celesta the first octave of the celesta has a kind of a thunky quality to it um, some of that I feel is a evened out a little bit in note performer and other um, notation software sound sets um, which is a little deceptive right <laughs> you know you should really know that it has kind of a dung, dung, dung kind of a quality to it um, rather than the kind of beautiful gentle, gentle chiming that we're hearing here so yeah, so I would possibly experiment with, you know, taking the harp up an octave, taking these two bars of the celesta up an octave, and then just seeing how how that sounds comparatively speaking. Um, I love the smoothness of the wind scoring, but I, I, you know, I'm wondering whether or not you you watched the pitfalls video where I talked about the the relationship of the middle voice to the left hand uh, staves in this section right um i feel that like that having this sort of interrupted phrasing right in here doesn't do anything for your beautiful lush wonderful slurs right in here i think it would be much better if you were to to state these pitches in the the clarinet and bass clarinet and so on like just to have them 
so that it continued to flow, right? Rather than that, rather than having this rest, da 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 da, you know that sort of da 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 da, especially with the you know with the with the um, uh, walking bass, you end up with this pluck da da pluck da da, you know it kind of turns into a little kind of a waltz, you know, or maybe like kind of like the um, um, that um, the Borodin. Right, um, Paul Vetsi and dance, you know, da 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 da. You know, I just feel that that's, I mean, in that piece it's great, but like it just has a kind of a connotation of really being paced, right? Like maybe escaping some of the pacing and letting things flow a little bit more around each other. So, yeah, so once again, kind of back to the basics with this, back to the pitfalls video, connecting these, making them flow more. I think it's perfectly fine, like having slurs that are nice and long, rather than just kind of dividing them up like this. And if you were to introduce elements of middle voice into these lines, then you could flow across half a bar and then flow across the other half a bar, right? Um, and then just like everything could connect really nicely. And you could even dovetail these phrases into each other too, right? So that they just get you had this beautiful, um, kind of nicely gushing, nicely flowing. Um, winds that aren't necessarily interrupted every time there's a melody note or a bass note. Um, but, you know, having said that, it's, you know, the scoring is very, very nice. You know, I like the, you know, the stacking of the clarinets um, and the and the flutes, and I, I like what the oboe and English horn are doing here. And uh, bass clarinet and bassoon, it's kind of a nice combination down there. So, yeah. Uh, and then this trade-off over into horns is also very cool. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Is this first horn or is this first and second horn ah uh, two with a lower with a lower staff of horns playing these thirds? Because I mean, if this is just first horn, then this should be second horn, and that should excuse me, this should be third horn, and that should be second horn beneath it, right? That would be a kind of more logical. To me, or I mean, you could leave this with the the, the partners together, right? That oh, that also works. The third and fourth, the way that you have it scored, is fine. But it's just I'm just really not sure about it because you haven't told me any numbers of any players, so I'm not sure who's doing what, right? Here it's obvious that's first, and this is second and third, right? But then what? Then you condense down to just two parts. So what are these parts? Or, you know, is this the, is it like first and second on top and third on the bottom? Or, I mean, what's going on here? All right. I don't, I need to know. Yeah. All right. Okay. And um, just, just an observation. Uh, piano or pianissimo, if you take my advice. Pianissimo, piano. And then suddenly you've got mezzo forte horns. And, you know, so like, I feel it's kind of a jolt. It would be nice if, like, maybe maybe there was a crescendo in the winds kind of leading to this, right? So that there was a nice smooth connection dynamically or something else. Or maybe you could push in from a piano into mezzo forte or something else. Uh, just, you know, something to make this not such a much so much of a dynamic jolt, right? Trying to find strategies to make these things smoother. Okay, all right. So now you've got pizzicato... Uh, lower strings and you've got bassoons so shouldn't they shouldn't these be staccato right shouldn't shouldn't you try to match the articulation and then same thing here staccato winds to pizzicato strings right i think would work really nicely and then like here like you really are getting kind of more savage with these doubled um you know da -da 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 -da. um that's all very cool. Uh, just one thing to point out is that the bass is just as heavy as you could make it here. And it just really feels like it's dragging the music down a little bit. I mean, do we need tuba there? And bass trombone? Right? It just really seems weighty. Maybe you don't need any lower brass right here. right? Maybe you don't even need contrabassoon. So just think about ways of kind of lightening this up because it just really feels heavy. And then here, like suddenly, like everybody is holding this chord except for the strings, right? And I, I feel like it's just all of a sudden, like the functions of the music, that's just a big jolt, right? Here you had 
a small amount of instruments holding, you know, a small but powerful amount of instruments uh, playing the harmonic and melodic role. And then all of a sudden you have everybody playing the harmony and the melody, except for the, the strings kind of doing their version of the patterns. So, and there's some copy paste stuff going on here, divisi, when there isn't any divisi, right? There aren't any intervals. So watch out. Yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, you know, maybe some of these, some of these players could continue to help out, right? Because see, here's another problem. Like you have so much weight, it it just there's so much motion all of a sudden, right? So like this, then this, then this, right? This does not necessarily follow that because you're going higher, right? You're not expanding outwards. You're just climbing, and then all of a sudden, everything's really big and bassy. And then, then, the, then, like the function, the strength of the function is completely absent from what the strings are doing, right? So that's just a problem, right? Maybe there doesn't need to be so much weight in the lower winds and strings on these lower parts. Maybe some of the lower or middle winds could be helping out here, continuing some of the motion forward so that this is more balanced and one bar seems to follow the next, right? Because you know, this is nice, you're climbing, then all of a sudden you have a jolt and then you have another jolt. And that's not even to mention the fact that you're kind of a jolting from pianissimo to mezzo forte here, right? So it's just, it's just kind of jolty is you know but like the the scoring itself is kind of nice it's very thick right it's probably way thicker than you need in terms of having like a nice clear beautiful chord but i mean it's a it is a nice chord it's it's not badly done um you know though the 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 bassoons probably are not going to have much of a chance against the trombones right so anything that like anything that would get overweighted, you know, like oh, shouted over by what's going on in the brass, just assign them um, a supplementary role assisting what's going on in the winds, right? So if you're not going to hear the, you know, from, from, from about right here, you're not going to hear these bassoons because of the trombone doubling, right? So better to have this help this out, right? Things like that, decisions like that. And here we get to one of your great payoffs, David. Just <laughs> some really great stuff happening here. All right. So, like, what this is suggesting to me is this is horns a tu a due, right? So this really just seems to me like this is meant to be two horns working together, right, along with the cellos. And if that is so, then I'm afraid that you would have to rewrite this whole thing, have uh, the... Um, the second, like, have this on both staves and have this part in second voice underneath and and so on. I mean, I, I, I know it just is tied up in a neat little bow to do it this way. You could also score this as one, three, two, four. That that would be a good way of getting around some of the, um, the, the conflicts in the notes sort of crossing each other and so on. All right. I really love what you're doing here, but what I don't love, you probably already know what I'm going to say, and that is I don't love the fact that you have so much dynamic mixing here. Yeah, so in the first place, I cannot hear these strings at all. All right, and it's, it's, they're almost thrown away, right? Like what, what role do they serve if I can't hear them? Um, I love the chimes being really loud. It's like a big solo for them. So. What, what you should do is you should rethink this entire passage. What are the solo elements, right? Which elements, you know, are playing the solo? So let's let's assume that this is horns one, three, two, four, okay? So um, that would mean that, like, and, and forte is really a good dynamic, right? I'm not so sure about just suddenly dropping to mezzo forte here without a diminuendo. I just, so it just does, doesn't make any sense to me, all right? So let's say that overall we're going to have our dynamic here. We're going to have a bit of a diminuendo here to a new, um, you know, to a new dynamic. And then here you're going to go mezzo forte, diminuendo, and you are going to put a destination dynamic at the end of the diminuendo, right? I mean, you need to, like, it's not enough to just, like, it, as far as a horn player knows, they're just going down to mezzo piano or maybe just, like, what Brahms would call poco forte. So like you're kind of somewhere in between mezzo forte and mezzo piano. So yeah, so look, um, 
I would say diminuendo to piano, right? All right, so forte, mezzo forte, after a diminuendo, I, I recommend you put in here, and so on. I don't really see the need for accented piano wins. I, I, you know, I think that, you know, I don't think you should throw in the accents. I think the accent should be in the chimes, all right? So horns are our, um, you know, horns and cellos, soli, I would write in here. I would write soli here, one and three soli, and um, same thing, cello, soli. All right, so those are our foreground instruments, right? And then here you're saying, well, um, contra bassoons, mezzo forte. So maybe the double basses should also be mezzo forte, and they should follow the same, so should the contra bassoons. They should all follow the same kind of, um, the same slurring pattern as the uh, as our solo instruments, horns, and like I think that this would be really beautiful at you know da da ia, and um, you know considering that this is twelve eight, I would definitely you know I would definitely write this out as you know three three like just have the have the bracket over it. Because uh, I mean, I know that like technically it doesn't, you know, it is not really a tuplet in in a way that has to change the mathematics of the meter. But still, I just, you know, I mean, neither is a two against a three, right? Uh, if you put a two, you know, two quarter notes uh, um, in, in the space of a three, four time, you know, crossing a bar of three, four, that is also not technically breaking the rules either. But... You know, you should mark it as a two. If that's true, then you should mark this as a three, right? So, three against the tw the you know half a bar of uh, of twelve eight, right? So, so that just makes a whole lot more sense, okay? And um, and so I feel that like this, like your foreground element, your your solos, everything else, they they can be forte, and I think that the double basses and contrabassoon. Um, and timpani can can be mezzo forte together. Chimes forte, a bass drum and cymbals mezzo forte. Okay, and maybe you're gonna hate this, but I think that the winds could also be winds and the strings could also be mezzo forte. Play around with it with your in your mock-up. Bring these elements out a little. Seriously, I mean, I just feel like the radiance of the um of the brass are basically just absorbing everything that's going on in the winds and so you can barely hear them and you cannot he hear the i mean i could just like there's just the tiniest little sound sound of you could dig it dig it in the background uh with these violins so this this um needs some work all right i'm not saying that my solutions necessarily you know my suggestions are necessarily the the final answer but it just needs a little bit of work so is this a symbol pair or a suspended symbol Hang on. Yeah, so you don't say, it just says symbols. Right. Right, so um, this seems more like a suspended symbol part, right? Because it's kind of got this sort of pulsing rhythm, right? You know, which is easier to handle with a stick than with a pair. Uh, yeah, so then here you're saying a big roll on the, like you have it's not a roll it is um yeah all right so so look um it might actually be a lot more audible if these pitches were rolled all right just because it brings them like there's the you've got the tail end of what's happening in the harmony and you know just kind of and and you've got the big clang on the chimes underneath it i think that all of those things will be absorptive of playing a chord without any without any roll in it to it, right? So I think it's better to you know to add the add the kind of sense of broken harmony there rather than just playing them all together. Like <laughs> these instruments are not loud enough to to really contribute much, and you have not actually given me a dynamic here. So like if this were like fortissimo or something like that, uh, maybe, but it still would not. <laughs> You know, it's just it's really out of balance the way that it's scored. So one way of bringing back in that balance is to have a rippling sound to the beginning of the chord. Right? The brim. All right. Now this is like this is your stroke of genius right in here, David. This is really nice scoring. Beautiful. I mean, it's sort of like you know, it has kind of that Holst feeling to it. Um, you know, just a kind of beautiful exploding, flurrying sound. So nice. 
Okay, and then, you know, and then here, like, you kind of have the echo at a softer dynamic. And I feel that this works really, really nicely, even though you're kind of reusing the same texture. Um, it, it's, it's really great, and it crosses over into this next thing. Um, you need to... Um, you need to proofread your slurs a little bit. Right, that should be under in second voice. Yeah, all right. And then this should go up here, right? So yeah, it just needs a little bit of proofreading. Mm, there we go. This sort of felt a little thick to me, like like you're kind of like, like it was it's, it was the contrabassoon really. Like I mean, I just really didn't see the need for the contrabassoon in there. Yeah, you know, and then just like the there's just a lot of doubling, right? And yeah, I think I think that you could lighten this up considerably. Think about different different ways of doing that. But like, I, you know, if, if anything, I would say that you use contrabassoon a lot in this orchestration. And um, and you you know, I mean, I know some contrabassoonists who are just you know they're happy to to have a really nice big long part just as long as it doesn't exhaust them too much. Uh, but, but, you know, you just have to think, how much do you need that kind of grunty sound, especially in really delicate textures like this, right? So, you know, there, there are, maybe you need less weight here than you think, right? It's kind of taking away a lot of the delicacy of what could happen. And then also, like, if this is piano, if you end up on piano here in your oboe, then what are you going crescendo to? Right. See, it's this kind of dynamic. I've, I've recently covered this several times. Like, does there need to be a dynamic in between um, open and closing, opening and closing hairpins? And, you know, my feeling about it is there doesn't need to be if you're only going up a little bit. Well, if you're only going up a little bit, maybe from pianissimo to piano, then what is this? What sense does this make? Right. Um, it's almost where you might want to say like uh, pianissimo crescendo diminuendo to pianissimo on this note and then piano subito right and then this would be marked solo um one last little observation is i feel that this bringing in the the um yeah uh, bringing in this much weight it also sort of messed with the the flow Right, so like you've got, you've got your descending uh, clarinet right in here, and then suddenly you just drop on. I don't know if this is one or two flutes, but you know, but it definitely is is more weight. Well, I mean that's not so bad, but what really messes with the flow is when you jump up an octave here. Right, we have this beautiful downward curve here, and it's really it's taking us somewhere. But all of a sudden, bam, you've got this octave higher leap, right? So I just like I'm not really feeling I don't feel like we're going down where somewhere where we can resolve. I feel like we're jumping up, right? So it's like really it's kind of messing with the emotion and the the, the flow of the melody right in there. So just watch out for things like this. Um, and this is a really lovely setup in here. Uh, but right, oops. And this should also, like, since this is using that kind of three uh, six against a 12 kind of a thing, or it's you know, sort of more like six against four strong beats, then I think this needs also needs to have two brackets over them, right? You know, bracket of, um, you know, of three and then three, right? Some people might say, well, that's six. No, it's not six. It's, these are these are each the time value of a single quarter note, right? But yeah, you know, other than that, wow, you know, this this is the page, this is the screen that wowed me the most. Really nice work, David. Now on to the next section. Section C, where we have also a very, very cool screen. And uh, I mean, there are still some problems, and, and we'll work them out as we go. Um, 
One of the problems, of course, is once again, we have a lot of dynamic mixing. You know, you've got a solo part here in horn, beautiful, uh, you know, a beautiful, very songful solo. Um, and, you know, once again, I would, I would try to have a slur that covered everything, just slur all the way across to here, right? One big long slur. And the same thing here, if you're going to do that. Um, but like, you know, pianissimo, uh, mezzo forte, uh, triple P, I feel all this is working against, like, and there's a kind of a soggy, un, you know, kind of less defined quality about it. And that's, that is kind of why. And then we have the further problem in our dynamics of crescendo to something or other, and then a diminuendo at the end. You know, if these things occur in a score, in a piano score, where like a single person is going to be playing the score, and the decision is all up to them, how loud or soft that they're going to make, that's great for them. But, but I don't think that it really has a place in an orchestral score, unless like the, the, unless the conductor is really guiding every step of the way. So like you need to decide what your, where your crescendo is headed and where your diminuendo is coming from. I mean, if you just had like two sets of hairpins, that would be fine. But then you have all these rests in between some of the pitches and everything else. Right. So I think, okay, I think it's fine to say crescendo, but like then, you know, where's the apex is probably on the downbeat here. Right. So you don't want the diminuendo on the downbeat. You want crescendo to, well, I don't know what, mezzo forte, something or other, and then a diminuendo off. And then if this is mezzo forte and you're saying crescendo here, does that mean that this is sort of forte or even fortissimo by the time you get to here uh, compared to everybody else's like softer dynamics? And then this right in here, like these players are killing themselves to get this right. Now, the first one is fine, except for these Ds, throwing in these Ds. I don't know why you're doing that if nobody can hear them, right? I say just go with the octave Gs. So this is all fine. All the player needs to do is just to have an open G and then these fingered Gs. Now, I've got a pretty big hand, and I was just testing this out, and it, this is a big... This is a very, very big stretch to be holding down these two octaves uh, in this position. Now, if it were a little bit higher, like say if you were having C octaves or something, or D octaves, uh, you know, up a, up a fourth, up a fifth, then the distance between the finger positions is a little shorter. But like the thing, the problem is you can't really finger this. Like if you finger this on the G string, then that sends this top G on the A string just, just you know... Um, just really way way up there it's just it's very difficult very problematic so this kind of the fingering position for this just would have to be you know d string a string e string and so it really is a quite a quite a stretch um so yeah so just like watch out for things like this like if the if the players are just completely killing themselves in order to get something right for you but nobody can hear it because you've told them to play very very much softer than everybody else then what they're going to do is they're just going to fake it, you know, or I, they probably won't. I mean, I, I think that like in a pro orchestra situation, this is doable, but I mean, it's just barely doable. And it's just a lot of, it's a lot of struggle for, you know, for almost no, uh, no effect. So, you know, I mean, yeah, with some practice and some woodshedding and so on, I, I you know, I mean, I, I tried it out and I, it was playable for me, but I'm not so sure somebody with small fingers could be reaching this. Maybe they could like kind of rotate back and forth, um, you know, on one of their fingers to kind of reach higher. But yeah, still, it's just such a, you know, it's kind of concerto, like, like this is sort of concerto writing. It's like, not that it's unplayable, but it's just... You know, it's just a lot of work. So, you know, like, and, and for what you're doing, you know, you could just have like, tr you could have octave tremolos, right, in the background, just on, you know, like on Divisi. So you could have a G up here and a G down there and then a G down there and a G down there, right? So like you could just have that stretched across here and you get the same exact effect that without all of the hassle, right? But, I mean, that that's not the big problem with this screen. I mean, it is really gorgeous, but once again, it just kind of has this lack of clarity. Um, you know, this this should be marked, um, you know, like, like 
as a as a three against a, as a three against a, a six or a three against a you know two beats two strong beats. Um, you know, same thing here, and that doesn't even get into this. But I I would just leave it alone. If if you're if you are gonna stick with this, then stick with it. But you know, maybe find a better way for the second violins to do what they need to do up here. Like if the if one of the pitches was like an open E, right? If you were an E G G G, that that would be a lot a lot easier, a lot easier to finger. Or like, what if it were like uh, um, an open D? Like, like what if you went D G G G D G G G D G G G, right? Um, I think that that would work a whole lot better. All right. Um, Okay, so what the way that I would approach this is, okay, number one, I would not mark this mezzo forte. I would just mark this piano. In fact, I would mark everything piano. And whenever, and like, I, I really love the sense of counterpoint in here. And I would clarify those separate lines by having them each have their own little dynamic arc, right? So, you know, bah, Right, and then you know, and then you have this da da da, right, and just have like a crescendo and a diminuendo, and like and have it start off piano ben cantando, and then same thing here. These things, these elements that come in here, a crescendo and then a diminuendo, and then like each of these separate little statements and middle voice things and everything else, they all would work together. I think this should be slurred, shouldn't it? Right. Shouldn't these be slurred? All right, um, yeah. And yeah, once again, this this should be slurred, right? Just like that. So anyway, um, so those are my thoughts on this section. I mean, I think it's I think it's just really gorgeous the way that you've scored it. Um, yeah, but it just needs a little bit of of clarification of certain things. One thing I might mark. Pianissimo would be the um, the lower brass, like I might, especially bass, trombone, and tuba. You've got all this weight on this low G down here, just a really rock bottom note, and you don't really have anything in between, right? Um, you know, I mean, you got your cellos, but they're they're you know they're kind of going back and forth between the G at the bottom of the staff and the you know and the G above, so it's like it doesn't really fill in the space in between. And and you've got the you know you've got your bassoons in a sort of a sort of a lower tenor position for most of it, so it just really does leave this gap in here. Um, it might be better just to have the trombone up and the contrabassoon down, and to have everybody you know, there's there's no entrance dynamic here. Have everybody uh, playing pianissimo, right? And but bring these guys out. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna make them do all this work, they should be nicely audible I think that they would sound fine at piano I don't think that you know I don't think that they're hurting anything to bring them out a little but very cool page really really loved it okay now on to section D now if there is one critique that I had overall with this page um, it would be right here okay um, I feel that like continuing this harmony um, just as the brass are rising up, you know, dun, 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 and just like, it really, you know, like without kind of correcting to, I mean, it's a, it's a cool idea on its own. Don't get me wrong. Okay. But, but the problem is like in sequence, right? Leading to the next, to the next part, it really kind of takes away attention from the impact of what's happening on the next screen, right? We have this, you know, this massive tutti chord right here, pow, right? And and it like it just doesn't really have the same kind of intensity to it because this happened, right? Because of just the just the the power of that, you know, the, those that kind of hanging chord up here. Okay, you know, once again, like it's really hard to find meaning in this without any guidance as to like who is playing what and you know. I mean, are we continuing on with like A2, 
horns like like maybe first and uh, first and third here and second and fourth there yeah um and then yeah and then trombones and so on and so forth i mean it's a beautiful brass chorale right in here uh and uh, you know it's it's kind of cool like you're you're just basically transcribing the left hand part right in here um with these octaves but it's good that there's a little bit of restraint on the um on your tuba um i i would i would actually kind of question whether or not this was necessary like just getting this profoundly low f sharp all the time right it just has this grunt to it it's just really not very pleasant you know what if it were a staccato in contra in contrabassoon and a tuba and a pizzicato in double basses and then you went to this and then the rest of it was just the way it was scored as you know as just a normal note and you know normally bowed note here and then once again staccato there because or excuse me pizzicato there with staccato uh, like a, just an eighth note staccato in your tuba because it just feels like it's going Argh! you know it just really sounds ugly kind of i mean sorry did not get too aesthetic on you here but it just you know like here this is fine this works great because of the build in the passage but just right here you know it's like it's all still kind of delicate dew drops and you know um it, it just really feels a bit off okay and you know right here you got clarinets and bass clarinet and um yeah is this is this ah two clarinets right in here so yeah so it's just like we still have some dynamic mixing in here you know forte and piano and so on and pianissimo bassoons i i mean i don't see why the bassoons need to be pianissimo here you know, I think that you could get away with having two dynamics in these four bars. You could have the um, the brass playing at piano, and you could have everybody else playing at like mezzo piano or mezzo forte, or you could have brass at mezzo piano and everybody else at mezzo forte, right? I mean, there's just got to be a better way of of scoring this than having you know three different dynamic markings in the same passage that are you know they're really kind of sort of scored around like what you want you know bringing this out and leaving that in and so on so it's really better to score to the strengths of the instrument and then have everybody be the same dynamic as much as possible with the exception of bringing up the harp and taking down the brass and when you have a big complex tutti like this and i mean the problem is that i repeat some of these things so often that people think it's what i mean all the time and it's not it's just when you have certain situations which are brought up to me again and again you know like this in like scoring very intricate integral scoring like this where parts are on top of parts and so on and winds and brass and so on that's when you have to take make those allowances and but it's not all the time because that's not the that's not the be all end all of scoring but anyway, um, shouldn't there be slurs on these? I mean, got da 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 da. It just feels, you know, you know, pa 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 pa. It just feels a little weird. Whereas da 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 ba. Or you could go for like a more articulated style uh, staccato. You know, da 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 would be nice. Yeah. Anyway. But I like the cascading. I like the way you connected things. I like the the bassoon trading off to the contra bassoon, right? I mean, certainly if you're going to have piano in your contra bassoons and you're going to be dovetailing in from the from the bassoon part, uh, certainly this should be the same dynamic, shouldn't they? All right. All right, and so you're like you kind of let go of the function of the of the cellos right melodically or or excuse me harmonically adding some harmony there in conjunction with the um with the lower horns and trombones yeah and just leave it up to the violas which are kind of weak really compared to to what they had at the beginning here 
But I mean, this is nice. I mean, I like the way you engage more, or this, you know, flowing across. Um, yeah, there's there's no need just because like just because the pianist ran out of hands, right? There's no need for you to just to stop cascading downwards, right? Like here, like the cascade has to kind of stop because of the fact that there is kind of more going on with the left hand, but the the cascading could just continue on in its pattern. It doesn't have to stop just because of this yada da da, right? You you're the orchestrator. You have this whole ensemble. You can do more than is in the score, right? So always look for that, folks. This is kind of a nice lesson in itself. If there's something in the score that in a piano score where like there's a kind of pattern going on and the 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 composer is hoping you don't notice that the pattern is sort of interrupted because the left hand was needed for something or the right hand was needed for something else. Um, you can just put that pattern back in, right? And this is nice. I like the build here in the timpani and a little tish here on the cymbals. Once again, you know, is this suspended or a cymbal pair? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I like the octaves here in the clarinets. I just feel like this part right in here could have had, you know, just could have had a little bit more. I mean, yeah, I mean, if there was just some way of using some strings in this, that would have been nice. Alrighty, but it's still a really cool page. Now here, we're getting into some more intense scoring, and I'm, I'm actually really, really glad that you sort of, like, left things, uh, you know, like you didn't, you didn't get too hot too quick with your, um, with everything that's going on, and, you know, and, and you, I'm not so sure how much I, I like these thumps, but they do kind of keep things, they do keep things moving, um, yeah, and you know, horns and trumpets and everything else. So, I mean, yeah, this really does kind of look like a mixture of, you know, one, three, two, four, and one, two, three, four, right? Because, like, here, this is kind of <clears throat> one, three, two, four scoring, right? And then here, this is more, you know, more like the you know the more more like the scoring that you would see in one two three four and then here um you know you have a voice crossing which there's absolutely no need for you to do that better to keep the player whose lip is is already pushing away at the top of the staff to have them play this written d up here right so yeah i mean they don't need a rest they'll be fine it's better to keep them where they are doing what they're doing Right, and the same thing, like it's better to have this player be playing this F sharp, right? Because they are right in that zone, right? The the more you sort of keep the players around where they are, the better. Although it's it's really fun to rip up or to you know, um, less fun to rip down. Yeah, and then when you go to two pitches, who's who? Where's the third? What's the third playing? Right, and what's going on here? Alrighty. Well, um, all right. So, all right. So my, my critique about this would be that I feel that there are two things happening here. Okay. That, that are, you know, are places where you can fill in, you should fill in, you should lighten. Okay. The first one is <clears throat> that you just have massive, massive octaves. Uh, you know, like it's it's not like these these players on these footballs, uh, dotted footballs, are uh, are really like performing any function other than just playing the bass line, right? So like you have a C sharp octave, and this C sharp is the same as that C sharp, and then these are C sharps, and this is a C sharp octave, and so on. Right, um, and this bass clarinet D sharp is a C sharp down here, and so on, and this is also so like it's just so much weight, so much weight on the um, on that, and it just just be, it just becomes this massive like a foghorn, right? 
and it's overwhelming everything else on the page, right? And kind of as we go along uh, into the next part, they're really, sorry. As we go on into this next page, there really is kind of no variation, right? So um, that's part of the problem, all right? All right, now, the other problem is that, like, you're making too many amends for what I mentioned before, for the uh, the problem of the fact that you know certain parts being played by one of the hands, um, you know that like there are there are things that are probably supposed to go on in the imagination of the composer, but they're just making them imaginary they're hoping you don't notice right and one of those things is just you know those triplets you know going yeah da 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 right but they you know but they're but obviously that's not happening because the they're like you know dun 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 so like that it interrupts what's going on in here but the problem is if you take that approach and you and you score it exactly the way it is then we can hear the gaps Right, we hear those gaps in there, and this is one of those things that I was talk. I think I covered in the, in you know, talking about the middle voice and things like that in the pitfalls video. Right, so people really watch those pitfalls videos because I cover some of these things. Right, and and also like you know, um, it, it's kind of nice to have some rhythmic counterpoint. You know, da da ba da da. Right, so if you kept up with the triplets, then you have a little bit of syncopation here. Right, or not really syncopation, but. You know, you have the um, you would have the two even eighth notes against the dotted rhythm, right? So you just have that that bit of counterpoint in there. So like we can really like it's it's just really you can feel the absence of of playing the chords when this approach is taken, right? And since since like there's there's kind of no help from any of these other sections on you know on playing this this rhythmic element. It just really leaves it up to the brass, and then they become really isolated and obvious, right? There are a lot of like Divisi, A3, uh, weird things. You've got chords, three note chords and stuff. Yeah, some of this needs a quite a bit of editing. And here you've got like, you've only got two trumpets when, you know, you've got a, you've got a three trumpet option here, but I'm only seeing two pitches. You've got your trombones tied up when they could be helping out with the, you know, with the triplets. They could be helping out with the, the static triplets or with the arcing triplets, right? So you have two different things going on here. Arcing triplets and static triplets. I don't think the arcing triplets are strong enough just in the horns the way that they're scored. And, you know, just, just boiling down the trumpets down to two when you could be, you know, screaming away at a higher pitch up there. Um, I think that they're, you know, like on, on the F double sharp, for instance, right, um, would come through really nicely, even though it's a melody or note, right? But like with all this much weight on the melody, I mean, it's, it's kind of a nice scoring of the melody. I almost feel like, like, you know, maybe first trumpet could have been playing up there. You know, I had it on an E flat trumpet, so it wouldn't be so hard. But, you know, bum, 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 maybe the color of of a of a brass instrument would have come in handy right and just be careful about transcribing directly from the piano score and and doing things like this where you have a you know you have a um you have a tie to a note here but that this doesn't do anything right what's going on here All right yeah just watch out about transcribing from or you know copy pasting right yeah and then this this right in here right, same thing okay so that is part of the other thing. So like I would say um, lighten up the bass line, take some of the instruments that would have been helping the bass line and use them to more fully inhabit the, um, the, these triplets and don't let the, um, the way that the hands operate together on the piano part interrupt the continuity of the musical idea right try to avoid direct transcription and instead like adapt 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 this is all really great in here i love how this is working but once again you could have had some um rhythmic counterpoint in here 
with the triplets continuing to hammer away. Yeah. And just, you know, just a lot of weight on the melody kind of going forwards with, you know, the cellos in there. The cellos could be doing other things, possibly. I like the timpani right in here. This is kind of cool. And then the big roll. This was great. I don't think it, you know, it's kind of a non-decrescendo thing here, but then you had the diminuendo and the timpani. And I thought that that worked, but it could have also just been left alone and with no diminuendo. But certainly, like, the bass drum roll, like, how long can you continue that going forward, right? So there, I see the logic, right? And this is kind of cool. Like, I, I just feel like there's there was so much potential here. Like, you've got such a great imagination, David. And, and I feel like maybe you ran out of time or, 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 you know, maybe it was felt a little overwhelming or I don't know what. But, like, I mean... I could like just seeing just the wonderful creativity with which you applied to the previous uh, the previous pages, you know, just the you know, how much could things have been expanded and expanded and expanded till you got to this point, right? So like I feel like this is the destination, like seeing how all of these instruments were used. Like could have there could there have been a lead up where the functions became less restricted to different registers, right? So um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's still, it's, it's still very exciting and, and, you know, very fiery and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, just, just watch out where the weight of the ideas and the functions go. Right. Um, but yeah, but, but all the same, like all over, you know, and, and looking at this, taking, taking in everything that you did, all the work you put into it, like this is definitely one of our, you know, most imaginative, well-scored entries so far, right? Um, we're kind of halfway through the process, so like there's another 43 scores to evaluate. Um, but you know, that's I'm I'm really in the zone with this right now, so it's going to go by pretty quickly. Um, but but yeah, um, this is just really excellent, excellent work, David. So I, I wish that you'd had a little bit more time to edit some things and to work out some things, maybe add a little bit more fire in some of these. You know, two T's and so on, and kind of balance some of the scoring and some of the other parts. But, but yeah, but still, just phenomenal work, and um, and you know, just an excellent, excellent effort. So, so thanks so much for putting the work into this and coming up with the ideas and sending it to me and making it making it a part of this challenge. You know, that is really the big thing for me is to see, you know, is to take a really good look at how everybody has interpreted. Uh, the same idea in their own personalities, you know, and I feel like that way I really get to know you musically <laughs> and, um, you know, see some, some definite things, some threads of development, some, some, you know, thoughts, some artistic philosophies and, and all kinds of different things. It's all packed into this orchestration. So, so thank you so much for sharing that with me and for, you know, for supporting the challenge this year. And especially with our, you know, are reaching out to other musicians in very troubled places right now and helping them. And uh, that means a lot. And it means a lot to me that out there, you know, a few hundred people, maybe a couple of thousand, will eventually watch this and will have some of the thoughts of their own. And just would really love it if people would leave some feedback below, you know, everything from just telling David how you like to score all the way to making some suggestions or, you know, it could be some disagreements with my particular take on it, or maybe there's some things I missed or some things I didn't have time to talk about. I know I'm making these as we're getting into <laughs> the, the home stretch here, I'm making these longer and longer, but it's just so exciting. I mean, I can't stop talking about it. Just such great, such great things to talk about and observe and to experience in everybody's score. So so thanks everybody for that. I really appreciate it, and it was so exciting to do this. Um, uh, you know, there was some some guy next door started using his chainsaw, and I thought, oh no, <laughs> this is gonna there's gonna be this massive rumbling sound, or I'll have to stop. But fortunately, just as I hit record, uh, he turned off his chainsaw. So we got lucky, folks. All right, and um, there will be some more evaluations coming up. Just every day, there's going to be at least one, if not two or more uh, videos for you to watch all the way through to the end of the year. 
All right, and then there will be a big party, and I hope that you'll be around for it um, as we approach the holidays. Thanks, everybody, so much, and I will see you again with another really cool video.